But then the moment you hit puberty, you get this desire and it's desire for the, it's really the mating function. When you hit puberty, you're capable of replicating. So now you have desire for the opposite sex and for having children and your genes spur you into action. And then, of course, the desire itself is, an, is, a, is a contract that you make with yourself to be unhappy until you get what you want. And so now you're consumed by the desire to go get what you want. And so go get it. I mean, when you, once you're an adolescent and up, you're fired up and you're ready to go. So that's the age at which you can go ahead and start compounding wealth and friendships and societal status. And you should go get all those things. And then once you've gotten your fill of those things, then you can sit down and say, well, actually, this isn't making me happier. Sure, I got what I wanted, but I'm not happy. And then you can tackle the happiness problem. So I think there's a there's a sequence to it. Now, if you're very gifted, if you're genetically gifted, perhaps you can do both. It's difficult to do both, but you know it's hard enough to make money. Making money is uh, somewhat creative, but it's also somewhat adversarial. Uh, every simple way to make money has been arbitraged away. All these people who are running, you know, get wealthy rooms and clubhouse, they're just scammers. I don't know. If they were rich, they wouldn't be telling you, they wouldn't be selling courses on how to get rich. That's not how to get rich. That's a get rich quick scheme that they're running, not a get rich quick scheme that's going to work for you. So nobody who's wealthy is going to give you actionable advice in a public forum on how to get wealthy. It, that, it's just nonsense. It doesn't work. Um, they can give you kind of vague generic principles, but not actionable advice. Anyway, so yeah, if, it's your, if, it, if it is your all-consuming desire, if it is your all-consuming desire and you can't wake, you can't sleep, you can't think, you can't do anything else uh, to make money, you will make money. The universe is rigged that way. If you have one overwhelming desire, it will give you what you want. But it's got to be your one overwhelming desire. But the problem is that most of us are creatures of mim mimetic envy. We look around, we want everything. You want her looks, you want his money, you want their friends, you want her attitude, you want his car, you want that person's family relationships, you want everything. Well, you can't have everything, you got to choose. Um, so I, I, I do recommend going for wealth creation relatively early because it does favor the young, believe it or not. Uh, and then when you're older, you'll have learned that the, the systems and the principles. And then aging naturally has a way of reminding you that you're running out of time. And that will force you to focus on your happiness because you'll realize, actually, I'm making enough money, but I seem to be running out of time. And time is the one thing I can't get back. So, yes, both of these things, things can be figured out. The myth in our society, there, there are two myths in our society. Um, one of them didn't used to be a myth. We used to call it the American dream. We used to say, hey, anyone can be wealthy. And I think that is still true. But the myth that is emerging now is that, no, you're a victim of your circumstances. and You can't make it, so don't even try. Um, or there are equivalent myths, like the get rich quick scheme myth. Like I said, all these clubhouse rooms or Twitter, you know, make money people who are selling you PDFs for twenty nine 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 or giving you a thousand secrets or, you know, I will teach you how to be rich kind of scammers. So th that's a myth as well. But the bigger myth in our society is that uh, you can't do anything about your happiness, that it's a set baseline point, or that it's determined entirely by your external circumstances, which is nonsense. Someone up here before, I think it was Leo, was talking about you know the hunt for a mate, which is fine, it's worthy. We all have to do it. I did it, you did it, everyone's gonna do it. But that man that she finds is not gonna make her happy. Absolutely not. Uh, that's not the, it's not another person's job to make you happy. It's your own job to make you happy, yourself happy. And uh, a happy relationship is a product of two happy people. If she meets someone who's happy, but she's unhappy, that relationship is not going to be a happy relationship or vice versa. If she's happy and she meets an unhappy person, it's not going to be a happy relationship. The way to have a happy relationship is to find a happy person. And the way to find a happy person, hold on to them is to be a happy person. It's like Charlie Munger says, you know, we want to find a worthy mate and be worthy of a worthy mate. So um, happiness is something you have to figure out for yourself. But the good news is it's completely doable. It's in your power. You just have to want it badly enough. But it's hard to want that and hard to want to make money at the same time. They do run somewhat against each other. So I suggest you make money first. And once you're done with that, then you get focus on happiness. As someone who achieved young, and uh, relatively speaking, it seems. And and then often for folks, for entrepreneurs, for people who are motivated in that way, that's their source of meaning and purpose in the world, right? When you achieve wildly successfully in this sort of common definition, and then you look over the precipice to the next phase of life, how do you balance, on the one hand, happiness and joy, and on the other, meaning and purpose? And how do you see the two living together? At, at that phase in your life? I'm, I'm curious. 
because what you said is fascinating to me. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have a prescription for other people. That, you know, the problem is that I think you that's... have to, you, you have to live up to your own moral code, right? Because your your life is just an internal single player game. You're not competing against anybody else. You're competing against yourself. You set your own desires and your goals. You have your own perspective. You have your own morality, and you have to live up to it. Uh, so there's no, there's no standard meaning or purpose if i gave you if there was a single purpose or meaning for all of us then we'd all be slaves to that single purpose we'd all be robots every one of us fighting each other in conflict to get that one purpose so and, and there's not even like a single purpose for you necessarily other than the one that you create so you you get to create your own meaning and purpose and you kind of crafted your own story here right it's like look at any situation you, you could have a situation where there are two people walking down the street right and the exact, they're in the exact same situation. The weather is the same for them. They're walking the same way. They're roughly the same health, they're roughly the same height. They have roughly the same, you know, attractiveness. They have roughly the same bank account. It happens all the time. You have two friends who are peers, yet one is unhappy and the other is happy. Why? It's just because the lens through which they've chosen to view the world. One of them has meaning, the other one doesn't. Why? Because one has just chosen a meaning that they can live up to, and you know they're full, they're moving along to that meaning. So you, it, it is a race, but you're just running against yourself. You pick the finish line, you pick the goal line, you pick the meaning, you pick the purpose. So you can pick a meaning or purpose that is antithetical to happiness, or you could pick one that aligns with it. Like there, there's a classic example where I was in Thailand once, and I ran, ran into this guy, and he was just like absurdly happy. Uh, one of the happiest people I've ever met and genuinely happy, not, not like pleasure filled happy where he's doing drinks or shots or, you know, running around the beach talking about happiness, but just calm, content, beautiful smile, married, had a couple of kids, just sort of floating along in life. And I went up to him and I was, and I was, I was pretty impressed by the guy. This is when I was really working on my own mental state. And I said, Hey, how come you just seem so happy all the time? And he said, well, he said, I used to work really hard, fly around, shuttle around. He used to work for Tony Robbins. And he said, I was setting up all these events for Tony, and I would sit in the front row, and I would take notes, and I would listen to everything. And he said, the thing that Tony helped me realize was just how malleable my own life is. You know, it's, it's, it, we grow up, you know, you're 10 years old. You've already set your goals and your personality, and you think that's who I am. He said, and Tony helped me realize, no, actually, that, that can be changed. You can revisit that. So he said, I realize that everybody has a purpose, everybody has a goal, and you know, you can set your own purpose. He said, I realize that somebody out there, somebody out there in the world has to be the happiest person in the world. Somebody just, it's their job just to be happy all the time. And they're an exemplar. They're a role model for everybody else. He said, that's going to be me. I'm going to be that guy. And he took on that role. So that's his meaning and his purpose and his happiness. So they're not mutually exclusive. This idea that they're mutually exclusive is a myth. Uh, it's, uh, I'll say something that I think is pretty controversial, but I think will annoy a lot of people. But to me, the only true test of intelligence is if you get what you want out of life. If you're not getting what, what you want out of life, how smart are you? Now, a lot of people hate to hear this because they think being smart means that you can't be happy, that they run against each other. Not really. If you're really smart, you'll figure out how to be happy also. Now, you get what you want in life. Now, you have to be careful what you want, right? If you want to have six arms and six legs, legs you're not going to get that out of life. If you want to be able to jump to the moon or fly, you're not going to get that out of life. So part of intelligence is not just getting what you want in life, but also knowing what to want, uh, what is rational and reasonable to want, and then only pursuing those desires as opposed to just wanting every little thing that gets thrown your way. But anyway, I, I reject this idea that meaning and purpose run counter to happiness. You can absolutely align those as many people do, right? Look at the Mother Teresa's of the world, the Gandhi. No, I, I right? would never assume that there. they're crosswise. Right. Yeah. Sorry, then I, I don't mean to straw man you. I, I may have misunderstood what you're saying. Um, I, they're absolutely compatible. Look, this is the oldest wisdom in the book, right? Go to the Bhagavad Gita, right? What does the Bhagavad Gita say? It says, you are entitled to your labor, but not to the fruits of your labor. What that means is, you do your work, but you don't necessarily uh, get attached to what the outcome is going to be. The value is in the job that you did. The beauty is in the work that you put in. It is complete in and of itself. Whatever happens, happens. That's not up to you. The universe is a big, complicated place. All you know is you did your best job, and that has meaning. In my world, that means that you're impatient with your actions at all times, but you're patient with your results. And you don't necessarily know how it's going to work out. You know, there's a beautiful saying in Arabic, inshallah, God, God willing, right? Inshallah. 
Yeah, whether you're religious or not. Sorry if I mangled it. I'm not. I'm not. I don't speak a language natively. But it was beautiful. I'm, I'm sorry for yeah. the Oh no, no, not at all. Thank you for helping. Um, but to me, that that is, uh, you know, that that is a lot of just how the world works. Look, you didn't choose where you were born. You didn't choose when you were born to your parents. You didn't choose what age you live in. You didn't choose your height, your weight, your genetics, your your environment, your conditioning, your actions. You know, you chose almost nothing on this planet so you do your best work that you can according to your own moral code and what's going to happen is going to happen it's kind of like a movie it's playing out how much of it did you really pick don't get too stressed out or attached to the outcome one very helpful exercise that i like is just and you have to do this for yourself this will help you only if you genuinely do it for yourself so i'm not going to do it for you no one else should do this for you but you know when you have a lazy afternoon sometime and you're sort of journaling or you're kind of self-reflecting or even going for a walk sit down and just think back to your life five years ago and really try to envision what your life was like five years ago think about where you were how you dressed, who your friends were, who your lover was, what you were into, what you were working on, what your emotional state was, and, and write down the best advice that you possibly can to yourself from five years ago. Then do the same thing to yourself from 10 years ago, and the same thing from 15 years ago, and 20 years ago, and however long it makes sense to go back. And I think you will find that you are your own best therapist and advisor. You're the person who knows yourself the best. And I think what you'll find is that there will be a consistent pattern in the advice that you give your for your previous self and i think that that will actually in a weird way answer the question that you asked but i don't want to do it for you because that loses all meaning true knowledge only comes from doing the work if you can't embody it it's not real naval that was amazing advice um i also i, I also heard you say once that all your uh fans are nerdy guys but and that may be true, but you know, I've I've recommended you to so many of my hot girlfriends because women are often told that life is a zero sum game. Not told, but taught implicitly. And um, and you talk a lot about how everyone can get rich, and you you've also said you're never going to get rich renting out your time. And also, forty hour work weeks are a relic of the industrial age. Knowledge. Workers function like athletes, train and sprint, then rest and reassess. So can we talk first a little bit, if you have time, of course, if you're not tired, a little bit first about how everyone can get rich and life is not a zero-sum game and, and we can all make it. Maybe people need to read your, your pinned tweet um, if they haven't seen it already. Um, and, and then about renting out time, if that's okay. Yeah, but I don't, I don't want to monopolize this conversation. So if other people want to speak, please do speak up. Don't feel like, you know, <laughs> I'm just here talking. I reserve the right to leave at any moment. It's sort of Everyone's quiet so. because they want you okay. to speak, bro. Please yeah, we want you to talk. Just please keep talking. Well, so good. I, just, I just want to say, Naval, um, you were the first millionaire to actually give advice on Clubhouse, I feel. So thank you because... Um, <laughs> I I just I feel like I couldn't get this in an ebook for some reason. I don't know why. Okay, look, I want I want to in college, want you university. All millions, so I will give you my best advice on that in a moment. First, let me just say thanks for recommending me to all your hot girlfriends. Unfortunately, my wife treats our relationship as a zero sum game. So <laughs> it is. That's <laughs> that is <laughs> And also, um, Nicole is a, is a hot woman who's also a fan. So, Nicole, don't don't forget to conclude yourself in that group. Um, of course. Anyway, so so on yeah, on on getting wealthy. Look, I use the provocative title "How to Get Rich" because it grabs people's attention. But we're really talking about wealthy. Wealthy is assets, right? And the goal here is to get out of nine to five. Nine to five is just modern slavery. Now, obviously, it's not the real horrific slavery that, you know, people's ancestors experienced, but it is a modern trimmed down form of slavery. It's wage slavery, right? Uh, you basically have to, you don't choose when you wake up. You don't, you have to like go to your drudgery job. You have to punch in the clock, punch in the hours as if we're living in factory times, as if input has anything to do with output. Well, we live in the age of infinite leverage with your mind. You can move mountains if you knew the right things to do. Elon Musk doesn't have more hours in the week than anybody else. He just spends it better. Um, or he has the knowledge to apply it better. Omniscience at some level implies omnipotence. If you were God, a God, and if you had infinite knowledge, 
you wouldn't actually need to do anything. But if you wanted to do something, you would literally just flick one particle of sand and you just knew that the way it was going to hit all the other particles that whatever you wanted to have happen would happen because you just knew how everything connected to everything. So knowledge is literally power. So the way to earn in the modern world is through knowledge and leverage. It's not through work. Um, and so you want to be a knowledge athlete if you want to earn, not a physical athlete. Physical athletes, you know, we put them in showrooms like the Olympics so they can show off, or we do it for fun or for health, but it's not the way that you actually gain, create and gain wealth. So to create wealth requires a couple of principles. Um, many of these are obvious, and it, it sort of helps to kind of put them together. Um, the, the place where I kind of create a framework around it, I say there, there are three things that you really need to do. Um, the first is you need to have some specific knowledge. The second is you need to take on accountability. And the third is you need to have leverage. Those are the three key components. Specific knowledge is knowing something, knowing how to do something that other people don't know how to do. And you can't be trained to do it. So then it begs the question, how do you learn it? What is specific knowledge? Examples of specific knowledge could be the artificial intelligence field is just coming up and I'm really deep into it or I have a really deep understanding of crypto, or I know how to do sales of, you know, very difficult, large objects. Like I know how to sell houses that are like broken down in need of repair. Uh, specific knowledge could be, uh, you know, I am the most entertaining gamer on the planet. I can play games on Twitch in such a way that people just love talking to me. It could even just be, I'm a great clubhouse speaker, but on a certain kind of topic that other people just don't understand. So how do you gain specific knowledge? It's almost a cash 22. Specific knowledge is built up by you through your passions. So when they say follow your passion, that's kind of what they mean. It doesn't always lead to money, but it can. Because if you're obsessive about something and you're learning it for your own genuine intellectual curiosity, not to get a degree, not to make money, not to impress your friends, you're going to end up being better at it than anybody else. So I really believe that you should only read and engage in activities that you genuinely enjoy. And you should cultivate your intellectual obsessions without any goal, but you may be surprised when you look back and connect the dots later that one of them developed into a goal. And one of the hallmarks of specific knowledge is that it will feel like play to you, but it will look like work to others. So that is that anything that fits that model, you should develop. So that is specific knowledge. Second, I would say you develop accountability. Accountability means taking on risks, branding it with your own name, eponymous companies like, you know, the Oprah company or whatever, whatever you may think of him. Like before he became president, Trump was all about this. He would stamp his name on everything. Kanye West, right? Jay-Z, Elon Musk. These people use their names everywhere they go. They are, but that means the accountability comes with downsides. That means that when you do something stupid or horrible, you're tagged forever. If you screw up, you screw up in public. So use your name, use accountability. And I know we live in an age of teamwork and obviously a lot of great work is done by teams, but even within a company like a startup, founders and managers are always looking for people who will take on accountability. So accountability is a big piece of it. You're never gonna get paid what you're worth if you don't take on accountability. And then finally, leverage. Leverage is the most important because leverage is just increasing without bound in our society. And there's basically three forms of leverage. There's labor, which is people working for you. That's been around forever. And your parents know it, which is why, you know, when you used to tell them, I've got a job, they ask, well, how many people are working for you? Or how big is the company? It sounds impressive. In reality, labor is the shittiest form of leverage. It takes too much effort to manage people. You're basically playing psychiatrist or babysitting. There's a lot of politics and emotions involved. Uh, it's just very hard to do. That said, if you want to build the biggest fortunes or the most wealth, it has to be in your repertoire. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions that go on in labor leverage. One example is people say, well, you know, there's no such thing as a 10X engineer. Of course there is. There's 100X engineers. There's 1,000X engineers. In intellectual disciplines, there's massive variance. It's Pareto distributed, not normal distributed, for those of you who know the distribution curves. But you know, another one is hire people who are smarter than you. That's another piece of nonsense. Why are people who are smarter than you going to work for you? Nobody has a good answer to that one. So there is an answer, it's not a great one, which is you hire them when they're really young and you, you, can you exploit them for a year or two before they figure out they're smarter than you and move on. So you can do some short-term opportunities or you can invest in people who are smarter than you. But you also have to be really good at what you do, otherwise good people aren't going to work for you. Anyway, that's labor. Then next is capital. You can use capital. Uh, you're, you make a trade, 
the same if you trade on the stock market, whether it's a trade you make with $100 or a million dollars makes a huge difference. Even though it took the same brain power to come up with the trade, now you're magnified in the latter case by a factor of 10,000. How did you do that? That's leverage, right? That's capital leverage. The problem with capital leverage and labor leverage is that they're permission. Somebody has to give you the money. Somebody has to agree to work with you. They take time to get, they take effort to get. With the capital leverage, there's often risk involved, especially if it's your own capital. So that brings us to the last form of leverage. And this is the most powerful form of leverage and is behind all the newly rich. And that is product leverage. Product leverage comes from building a product. And the, the, if the product has no marginal cost of replication, in other words, you can stamp out more copies without having to incur cost, that is the best form of leverage. Product leverage uh, ranges from code, where you create applications like Clubhouse. We're all on Paul Davison's uh, you know, piece of code here, and he's massively leveraged. Paul's not here right now. He's not running this conversation. We're all working for him. Um, it also comes from media, like creating content, like Joe Rogan creates a podcast and gets stamped out. It can come from a book. Uh, it can come from even products like, you know, someone sells you a pill, like a, it could be a happy pill, a sugar pill, whatever. Uh, a pill is 98% intellectual property. Um, it, you know, the actual physical cost of what went in there is very low. Uh, so fundamentally, what you want to do is you want to put yourself in a situation where you take your specific knowledge that you've developed over the years without even trying, the things that you're good at, that other people are naturally bad at, that you got to by following your own intellectual obsessions. You add that to accountability, put your name on it, take some risks. You employ every form of leverage possible, capital, labor, and products and code, preferably the permissionless ones because those you can get access to when you're younger. And the net result is you productize yourself. What you end up doing is you end up selling a product that is simply an extension of who you uniquely are. And nobody can beat you at that because it's just you being you. Uh, and this can take a while to set up, but once you set this thing up, it will be a flood, a tsunami of money that will keep you flush for the rest of your life. And then you can figure out how to be happy. So we need to be rich first before we're happy, or at least, or at least comfortable, at the very least comfortable. Leah, I didn't even, after all of yeah, that, I didn't even yeah. realize. <laughs> yeah, saying. right. I didn't. I didn't even realize I liked tsunamis until I knew they came in the form of money. Oh my god! And now, um, here we are. Here's here's another thing. Uh, Advanced move. Here's another <laughs> thing, Naval. Um, you said if you don't own a piece of a business, you don't have a path towards financial freedom. And you know why is owning equity in a business important to becoming rich? versus wage work. Can I just interject? Wage. It sounds like you had a very compelling case for conditional happiness, but not unconditional happiness. And I'm curious if you differentiate between the two. Uh, real happiness is unconditional. The moment you have a condition, then you're basically saying, I'm not going to be happy until that condition is met. So if you, if you meet somebody who's really free and happy, that's unconditional. But, you know, most of us aren't monks or sages or Buddhas or planning to get there anytime soon. You know, we're on this earth for some kind of the fight, you know, so we want to do something interesting with our lives. So uh, it's not going to be unconditional for most of us. Uh, but you're right in that the real happiness is unconditional because otherwise there's always something screwing up the moment. There's always some sense of something missing in the moment that messes up your happiness. Uh, I think the, and the question was, about owning a piece of the business yes what i described about accountability leverage and specific knowledge eventually you productize it into a business equity equity is the upside so when you look at a business the way a business runs is a business essentially has uh three sets uh well the, the, yeah let's call it let's go okay let me let me make it a little simple four sets of people who have claims upon the business a business is a bunch of assets, right? It's a bunch of value. And there are four sets of people who have value claims in that business. One is customers, right? And the customers have, they've paid for some product and they're owed some of the product. Very simple, straightforward, limited, easy. Then there are uh, creditors. These are the people who have lent money to the business and they got to get paid back their coupon, their interest rate every month. Otherwise the business goes under. But notice that they're always just going to get their interest rate. They're not going to get more. They're not going to get less. And if the company can't repay, the company is bankrupt and they try to recover what they can. The employees are actually very much like the creditors, they and the customers. They work 
but they're going to get a set amount. They're getting security, they're getting insurance, they're getting fixed employment. And then finally, they're the owners of the business. And one of the beautiful things about Silicon Valley is that people give equity to the employees, so they create a larger class of owners, but the owners actually don't get anything guaranteed. The owners do not get anything in the form of insurance or in the form of predictability, but they get all the upside. And in the, mo and in the modern world, it's all upside. You're only playing for upside because the upside can be so nonlinear. These businesses that were worth $10 million when they started out can suddenly be worth $10 billion a few years later. And all that upside goes to the equity holders. So you must own a piece of a business if you want a path to financial freedom. There's literally no other way. Even the people who make a lot of money um, by supposedly renting their time, like when you see doctors or lawyers who get very rich, um, if you squint, what you see is that they actually own a private practice that has some kind of a brand, and there are a bunch of other doctors or lawyers working for them. Uh, and yeah, there are bankers who kind of, I would put at the top end of the wage slave spectrum, uh, but even there, the best ones are hedge fund managers who own their own business called a hedge fund, as opposed to the ones who are working as you know brokers on Wall Street and still getting paid a salary. Um, as long as the, the, the hallmark of having a business is it's an asset that will earn while you sleep. It will earn while you're on vacation in Tahiti. You know, if you, you want to be in a position where you don't have to wake up at a specific time, you don't want to have to be in a specific place at a specific time, you don't want to have to answer to a specific person at a specific time, and you don't have to do anything that you don't want to, which doesn't mean you won't do things. You'll actually then be at your most creative and productive. But to get there, you have to own a piece of a business, and that business has to have succeeded. So you basically want to grind in your career until you can hit escape velocity with a business. And once you're, once you're done with that, don't go back to wage slavery. I love it. Thank you, Naval. One more thing. I wanted to read another quote. Um, and then, I mean, it doesn't need to be elaborated, but I feel like you can talk about it a little bit for people. Um, you said, doctors won't make you healthy. Nutritionists won't make you slim. Teachers won't make you smart. Gurus won't make you calm. Mentors won't make you rich. Trainers won't make you fit. Ultimately, you have to take responsibility. Save yourself. Let's talk yeah, about I mean, it. It's a, yeah, it's a little glib. I mean, it's basically just mo most of coaching and mentorship and all that is just procrastination. Everything interesting that anyone accomplishes in their life is done because of will to power. At some point, they decide, I just have to do it, and they do it. There are unlimited gurus. There are unlimited motivational speakers. There are unlimited guides. There are unlimited training routines out there. If you're obsessing over, you know, just think about this. Like, like the, the amount of time that I've spent reading nutrition books if i had just adopted the nutrition policies out of any one of them it literally almost doesn't matter which one i would be in better health right i don't need to keep reading so it's a form of it's a form of procrastination it's like intellectual accumulation keeping me busy from doing the actual thing um you again you get what you want out of life you just have to want it badly enough if it's your all-consuming desire, you will get it. You the, the you will create the path to the destination, no matter what it takes. Uh, so I think a, a lot of the, the the right answer here is just not fooling yourself about whether you want or don't want something. Uh, like for example, I kind of adopted this uh, internal deal with myself, which is I said, hey, I'm not going to break my own word to myself. If I make myself a promise, I will not break my word to myself. Okay, great. Now I get to say that and it's only good once. It's only good until the first time I break my word with myself. Then that technique, that whole system of techniques no longer works. So now if I want to drop a bad habit, like say if I want to drop caffeine, I can't lie to myself and go through this whole rigmarole where I pretend to drop caffeine and I struggle to drop caffeine and I try to drop caffeine. It's like, no, if I give myself my word to drop caffeine, then I have to drop caffeine. Otherwise, yeah. I'm never going to trust myself ever again. And boy, wouldn't that be terrible. So that, that really puts things into a stark focus, right? It makes it clear that most of what we think we're doing when we're asking for help, when we're going to seminars, when we're watching YouTube videos, we're just procrastinating. We're not really serious. When you're serious, yeah, you just yeah. do it. So a lot of this is really not about struggling or trying. It's about figuring out what you are serious about.
like it, you know th there's a there's a common belief now that it's impossible to drop habits like you can only re replace them or you have to go through this massive 12 step process of changing yeah it's not easy to drop habits not easy at all but i'll tell you there are uh, everyone in this room has at some point in their life gone through a situation where they've they've struggled with something they have a hard time with something it could even be a relationship like you you're in love with somebody and uh, then you you then you see something about that person in one brief moment that you cannot unsee or someone betrays you or backstabs you and you see them for who they are and you can't unsee it and that's it you're changed at that moment they're gone or if you are, you know, addicted to some substance or to some kind of food that you know is bad for you, or so just some general habit, and then you see the damage that it's causing. Like for example, if you were smoking and then you got lung cancer, right? And if you saw very clearly that that was causing you the lung cancer, you would drop the smoking. So a lot of times, it's it's we're we're just in this conflict avoidance mode where we're pretending to work on things that we don't really want so i don't believe in struggling anymore I, I just think it's much more about just being very very clear with yourself do i really want to drop this and if i really want to drop this then i give myself my word that i have dropped this and i will never waver for them from that because if i do then i can never trust myself again so it, it's it's a lot about just focusing on what you absolutely genuinely want and then following through with it and ignoring all the noise because otherwise the world is just full of too much noise no naval is it is it fair to assume that you don't set new year's resolutions for yourself then i don't believe in new year's i don't believe in holidays i don't believe in resolutions. no but i mean just the idea the notion that like you set goals to to work to achieve certain things like from what you're yeah, saying it sounds yes. like you just you just manifest it right you just do it you don't you don't believe you live, you, you live your life you be happy and then if you really want to manifest something then you go after that thing and you nail it but you know don't don't do things halfway don't 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 just try to look cool don't just yeah, try to look good either do it or don't do it so you think people waste their time you know saying like i'm gonna wait till january to do this hit list of things and it's gonna take me you know x amount of months to achieve those things right so making a list actually sets you back yeah and look i'm not perfect here i i struggle with my own thing so uh, this is aspirational right when, when you see me tweeting or writing about this stuff it, it, it's like who, who is uh, who are the best people to talk to about heartbreak the people about their heartbroken a lot right who are the people who are good at making money the ones who grew up poor right so the same way who are the people who are good at breaking habits or or cultivating uh, good habits it's people who struggle with bad habits and addictions their entire life i have an obsessive personality i drop into bad habits very quickly it's very difficult for me to break them so i you know i don't i don't, I don't fall for the new year's resolution trap anymore i've seen through that one but i do struggle with things but now i've realized at least now i've started to see within myself that huh the few times i was able to break a bad habit or change something it's because i i it, it was just my overwhelming number one priority and it was because i saw something about it that i could no longer unsee i saw a breaking moment there, there's a, a you know another perspective is like suffering is a moment when you can no longer deny the reality of something right like let's say you're in a relationship and you've kind of been overlooking the other person's negative traits or you know what's not working for you in the relationship and everyone's on their good behavior they want to make it work so you're walking on eggshells you're trying to make it work trying to make it work and then the other person dumps you and it's not like you didn't see that coming you, all these signs were there all the evidence was there but you were just avoiding it you were you were kind of brushing on the rug and the suffering comes because you see it all at one instant and you you can no longer live in this fantasy land of this fantasy relationship that you had constructed so it is that sight that is so important in fact i would say that if you live your life with complete and total and utter honesty it becomes much easier you become much closer to peace much closer to happiness much closer to effectiveness it, most of most of the problems that we encounter within ourselves is because we're not being honest with ourselves and why are we not being honest with ourselves because we have some image of ourselves that we can't live up to 
And so we're trying to pretend like we're someone that we're not. And it might also be to impress other people. That's the modern disease, right? You jump on Clubhouse, Instagram, Twitter, everyone's showing their best lives to everybody else, their fake best lives. And and, and so, so Paul, I have a quick like question on that. Yeah. Does that change when you have a million dollars? Look, I'll say there's a threshold you get past where you're not fearful anymore. I can only speak for myself, right? I can't, like if you were born rich, maybe you have different outlook, maybe your numbers are different. I'll just say that there was a point in life where I got to a point where I was like, okay, I could like breathe a sigh of relief, right? Where I don't have to work anymore in a job that I don't want to do anymore. That was like a tremendous sigh of relief. So, you know, the people who say money can't buy you happiness, my retort to them is it can if you earned it. You know, like if you, if you, if you know what it's like to be poor, if you start there and if you know what it's like to struggle and if you earn it and you have some satisfaction around it, you don't have imposter syndrome or guilt around it, it gets you to a level where you don't have to worry about it, then yeah, it'll get you to a baseline. It's bullshit that it's not going to buy you happiness. Use your imagination, people, <laughs> right? It's not so bad. So uh, may maybe people say it can't buy you happiness because they're just afraid that then they'll, you know, or maybe they want to make poor people feel better. I don't, I don't know what the reasoning is. But anyway, I think, yes, it can get you a certain baseline level of relief, which, you know, everyone should frankly experience. Um, that said, it's not going to make you, it's not going to make you like genuinely actually happy. Uh, I know far more rich, miserable people than I know uh, miserable normal middle class mm, people and that is a level fact. of poverty below which yeah i would say below a certain level of poverty like misery reintroduces itself um but there are things that matter a lot more for quote unquote happiness which is probably the most poorly defined word in the english language um you know right up there with love um for uh th there's a lot of different ways uh, things that go into the so-called happiness uh like community friendships values self-esteem peace uh you know ambition like your level of ambition or desire perspective um religion frankly you know religion is something we threw out the window uh because we rejected it once we found science and uh we saw ex the excesses of religion we threw religious values out the window um but i think we're poorer for it and now we are creating religions where we go there's new fashionable religions popping up everywhere under different names uh and we're suffering for it uh yes. and there, was, there, there was there was a really deep deep part of being human that spirituality fills and you have to fill that somehow in fact, it, it's the, what is what are the most important question in life? The most important questions in life are not how do I make money or how do I be happy or who do I marry or where do I date? The most important questions are like, what the hell am I doing here? Right? What, what am I, I here, here for? Why am I here for? What am yeah, I here for? for? This right. is this is a part of the conversation that I I definitely am am so thankful that we're first of all, brother, I love everything that you're saying so like-minded is is i think that you were aside from, i know everyone in this room has you have given them uh there's great value in you being here but i think for for me uh everything that you're saying is just like you were sit here for everything that's going on in my life right now um my just in too. terms of what my my purpose is um, what the next phase of my life is like I've been an actor for 36 years of my life and I had to go against every norm in Hollywood I grew up in 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 Brooklyn where my father was in out of jail my entire life and uh, necessity is the you know is the mother of invention so when you were talking about hey when you want it you're gonna create it and you're gonna you're you're gonna get there I didn't know anyone in the industry I had to I had to bust my tail every single day people thought i was crazy for you know um desiring the things that you know that i said that that i wanted out of this life and every single thing that i said that i wanted i got from the way you know from the way i live where i live having a wife having two children and i'm talking about specifics like when i was a kid i was like i want a wife i want two children i want i want two dogs uh, all of those things, just being specific about those things, uh, having that intention and then working toward it. Um, the thing that I want to ask you just in terms of purpose, because I often tell people 
that acting is my my passion, but activation is my purpose. And so I wrote this book and created this platform based out of the pain that I experienced with my father and him not having him not giving me the messaging of manhood that I needed. And it created a a, a great deficit in my life. And so it took a lot for me to get to the other side of it. And I never want to see anyone else suffer the way I suffered. So everything that, that you were talking about in terms of, um, you know, doing the thing that you feel like is play to you and maybe work to everyone else. Like what I do now is something that I could do for feels like 24 hours straight. And all I need is a glass of water and I'm fine. And everybody else is knocked out after, you know, a, a said specific period of time. And my battery is still full because I feel like this is my purpose. Like when God created me, he created me to be a, a servant. And one of the things that I talk about in my book is how men are supposed to be servants while males, you know, look to serve themselves. And so I just want to talk to you about or ask you, what is it that you feel like in your life has become your your purpose and whether that i've always told folks if you if you're true to that that you know your 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 money your profits all of those things will come as long as you submit to what you feel like your purpose in life is can you talk a little bit about that <laughs> uh, i don't want to quite say what my purpose is. My purpose is ludicrous. It's absurd. It's not worth talking about. <laughs> you know, wait, Nicole, sorry. Can I can I suggest a purpose for you on Sunday, please? Sure. So 5 p.m. Pacific on Sunday, Nicole and I are hosting the next stand-up show on Clubhouse. And we'd love for you to drop in if you'd like to laugh with us, Naval. <laughs> I don't this schedule anything, but thank you. I literally don't oh, challenge you. I, I know you don't, but <laughs> if I didn't tell you, then it wouldn't even be planted, planting a seed in your mind. So now it's sure, there. If you, if, you, if you catch me on Clubhouse, pull me in. But uh, one of the things that I get away from is uh, the, the slavery of calendars. And, uh, oh, my that's God. Kind of the point I that. And, and let us say amen. And let us say amen. That's, amen. That's, that's amen. I, I actually have a question for Dondre. Actually, I have two questions. Dondre, is your father still alive? Yeah, my father is alive. We um, we actually reconciled after uh, 20 years of being estranged from each other. My father kidnapped me at age six, um, basically taught me how to be a, a cheater at age 12. And so I, I, I witnessed my mother and my father being extremely volatile towards each other. Um, and at, uh, at 46, after having a conversation with my daughter, who simply just asked um, do you know where your father is? Um, I realized that God was sending me a messenger that was telling me that it was time for me to heal up those wounds that I had with my father. And instead of seeing my father like my father, and instead of uh, instead seeing him like my spiritual brother, who um, whose uh, development was arrested around the same time that my development was arrested. Um, I really began to have a pathway forward and have an empathy for my father. And, you know, as I often say that, you know, it's always incumbent upon the one who has the gift of understanding to be more understanding. Yeah. And because I was in this place in my life, I knew that I, I had to do something in order to reach out and to help my, my father. That was my you, assignment. You sound like you've been healed, but has your has your father been healed as a result of your your tolerance or at least your your patience with him yeah and i don't want to say tolerance because and i know what you what you mean um yeah but i, I don't i don't want to use the word tolerance because you know I, that would make me you know that would put me in a space where you know i'm this higher being and that my father you know um uh isn't um i i just had a, an understanding that my father uh, was a byproduct of all the things that he got or didn't get. And so my father couldn't give me what he never had. And so right. my assignment at that point to, you know, to Naval's point earlier, speaking about spirituality and, you know, while I don't consider myself to be um, a religious man, a lot of my spirituality comes from specific religion, right? And so I am a spiritual man 
Um, and so I had to see myself in the, in the space of being a spiritual being and under God, my father and I are both brothers. Why? Because we are both God's sons. And so for me, I had to see myself as my, my, my father's spiritual brother. And it was my assignment at that point to give him what society never gave him. They never gave him grace. They never gave him understanding and never gave him awareness. Right. And so in me telling my father, Hey, I love you. And, and, and I forgive you. And I understand, um, we went from seeing each other after 20 years of, um, the last time I saw my father, I was 26 years old. And I told him if I ever saw him again, that I would kill him. And so when we saw each other for the first time in 20 years, I got out of my car and he stood up off of the steps of his uh, porch and, you know, at his, his place. And we didn't say anything for five minutes. We just em- embraced each other and we were both in tears. And we both turned out to be two men of faith, two, uh, two men of different faith, but we recognized each other as two men of faith. So not only did it heal me of all the pain that I was carrying, that was secretly making me angry and be this person that could blow up at a moment's notice because I was carrying around this pain instead of casting it, but it healed my father as well. I'm happy for you, man. That's Thank deep. you, my brother. I appreciate it. I'm real yeah. happy. Thank you, you Andre. That was Thanks for sharing amazing. that, dude. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that and being so vulnerable, Dondre. It, it, it also, it just reminded me of how uh, Naval said we need we need religion, but we've moved away from it. Um, yeah, that was dope. Because yeah. those are those yeah. are all the, we keep you know <laughs> we keep running away from it, and we need the the the, the constructs of what it does for us, you know, in 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 the spirituality space. Go ahead, brother Naval. I didn't mean to interrupt you, bro. Oh no, 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 I don't mean to interrupt. It was a beautiful story. Uh, I mean, if I could add to it, just on a, on a little bit of the edges, a couple of things about what you said. You know, I've had. Um, my own experiences, I would say my father gave me the gift of not being around in my life. And that allowed me to become stronger and resilient and capable and to figure everything out for myself. And so I am grateful to him for that. But it took me a while to get to that perspective because the easy narrative would have been like, damn it, my dad wasn't around. So I got screwed over in so many ways. Um, But it made me the person that I am. And whatever your father's treatment of you might have been, it doesn't sound good at all. You know, it it made you into you, and you look great, right? You look like you turned out <laughs> yeah. well. So yes, sir. I don't see how it could have been a different story if your father, maybe if your father had been like super loving and great to you, you'd be kind of a wimp, right? So yeah. I, I I don't know. I don't know if it's so bad. So it may it you may know, help it, to have that and, story, and, right? And 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 for that, and I know exactly, I I know exactly what you're saying, and and, and agree. Um, on, on so many points, I think, you know, for me and even for some of the folks that, you know, that are out there and, and, you know, and, and, and listening to this, for me, it was about eliminating some of the, the key points of, of trauma that, um, may have, you know, may have been a, a little, um, unnecessary, but then when you look at the other side, so say like at six years old, you know, when a, you know, a, a person who's responsible for your life takes you or steals you away from the other person that's responsible for you in your life, in that case, my mother, and then waking up, you know, in, a, in his car in the middle of the night, 2.30 in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, not knowing where, you know, where your father is, and you're six years old, and you have to navigate you know, dangerous streets of Brooklyn in order to find your way back to your mother. Um, those points of, of trauma can sometimes feel like um, they're unnecessary. But at the same time, to your point, you know, they're kind of like um, if you were trying to construct a great recipe, right? Sometimes you add um, something bitter in order uh, to accentuate what is sweet, you know, in the recipe. Right. And so 
Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes we have to find the pathway forward through our traumas and the, to understand how they actually shape us. If I didn't have those things, I may not have been activated enough to write male, my book, Male Versus Man, right? And so to your point, some sometimes some of those things are some of the, the actual key ingredients that go into making uh, us into the dynamic human beings that we become as a result of having to get through them. The first is exactly, you know, it, uh, warriors get built in wartime, not in peacetime. And so you're a warrior, you had to go through your wars. I think the second part of it is that there, there are things that happen, and then there are stories that we tell ourselves as to what happened. And those stories are very powerful. And if you can change the story of what happened to you, it's sometimes just as good as changing what happened to you. And yeah, uh, if, for example... Yeah, for example, forgiveness, right? You don't forgive because you're a good person. You don't forgive because you're doing the other person a favor. You forgive so you can finally have peace, so you can move right. on, so you can clear your own mind, so you can be fresh and powerful and strong and going forward. Sorry, yeah, because the only steps. person I'm hurting is myself <laughs> by holding on. To exactly, that. exactly. Yeah, you're holding this grudge, which is like a hot poker in your brain every time you think about this. So, and, and you can't let it go prematurely. You can't fake it either. If you fake it, you try to forgive, it'll, that splinter will always still be there in your mind. But you just have to get past it at some point. At some point, you just get exhausted with holding the grudge. And you realize, actually, the carrying of the grudge is doing damage to me. And it's not like I'm actually getting some form of revenge or satisfaction in the other person. And that's the point at which you're ready to let go of the grudge. So uh, before, when I was talking about how you change when you see something properly, same way you forgive someone when you see the damage that is causing you, you reinterpret your story when you see that those stories are malleable. All of these all come from one place. There's a common root to all of this. And the common root is just self-awareness. And self-awareness is a thing that can be cultivated. So when people say, like, how do I become happy? It's actually just be more self-aware. How do I become more successful? Just be more self-aware because then it'll tell you what your true desires actually are. Self-awareness is the core of self-improvement. And natural, gradual, inevitable self-improvement, not the kind of the fake kind where it's like, oh, I just need to be better because my friends are better. And self-awareness is the thing that is an incredibly short supply today. Self-awareness requires first that you be incredibly honest. You never, ever, 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 ever lie to yourself and you never lie okay, to somebody else. Okay, we can else. just stop right there. We can just stop right there. Because how many of us in our society are really, truly willing to be honest not, and then we wonder why we're not in honest relationships yeah, right this, because yeah. the vast majority of us are so afraid to be honest with ourselves and then we wonder why we can't be in honest relationships and usually it's because we're not being honest with ourselves first Noval, please i have a question for you um i'm just in awe of everything i've heard you say in the past hour so just been taking notes at one point, at what point in your life would you say you developed the level of clarity that you have in life? Was it was it a moment that triggered it, or was it a series of events that led you to this point in life? I think uh, clarity comes from on it's a combination of three things. Um, it comes from honesty, a commitment to honesty, which I developed when I was very young. Um, because I grew up in uh, the rough and tumble streets of Queens, uh, and I used to hang out, hang out with some really rough characters. Um, <laughs> I used to hang out with some Russian mobsters when I was a kid. There were other kid mobsters, you know, junior Russian mobsters. But they sort of had this weird code of ethics amongst them where they were brutally honest with each other all the time. And if you told even the slightest white lie, they would beat the living daylights out of you or out of each other. But if you literally told them the truth, they would believe you even if their life was on the line. So it was just something that drilled honesty as a core virtue into me early on. Uh, and I've always loved science and physics. And so like those are also all about truth seeking. So truth was sort of always my, my number one value, where it was to the point of I would rather be unpopular and disliked and be a loser in life and know what's real and what's true. And, and speak the truth as opposed to the other way around. Pe- people can always, you know, people don't always know 
the sound of truth, but they know the feel of truth. You know when someone's trying to snow you. You know when someone's bullshitting. Deep down, you're you're hardwired for it. I think people are hardwired for it. So just speaking the truth, just having a deep, deep conviction for it. Not just not the simple one where it's like, yeah, I'm not gonna lie. No, I mean deeply convict deeply convicted and always telling the truth. That was a, a really big piece of it. Second is I had to figure everything out for myself. Part of it is because, you know, my dad wasn't around. Part of it is just because I, I I just don't believe anybody. Because if you're truth-seeking, then you're also very skeptical because everyone's always trying to persuade you. The world is full of propaganda. Every major institution is spewing propaganda at you. Every book is spewing propaganda at you. Everyone's got a point of view. They're trying to convince you. Almost nothing is clean. So you have to figure everything out for yourself from the ground up. So I'm still not good at the advanced stuff. Um, you know, I'm not going to be good at uh, calculus or advanced physics or even like you know you could throw any advanced philosophy concept at me and i'll give you a blank look but i just know the basics and i know them rock solid i would rather just read an arithmetic textbook a hundred times until i understand it than move to geometry if there's even a single thing in the arithmetic textbook that i don't know cold so no memorization just understand the basics over and over until you have clarity and then the third thing is self-awareness and self-awareness for me is, you know, cultivated originally through solitude. Every exceptional person is built in solitude because society is over-socialized. Uh, we're just, too, there's too many voices in our head from TVs, from social media, from the clubhouse here, from me talking to you. There's just too much noise. Even all the stuff that I'm saying to you is noise because you're going to go back and you're going to be like, man, that guy had 20 great ideas. How do I become like him? And that's completely the wrong answer. You're never going to be me. But you can be an amazing version of you. You can be the best you that the world can possibly have ever seen. And the way to do that is to spend time by yourself. It's to only like, like to really just embrace who you are 100%. Like, and I don't mean this in some cheesy, like, oh, you know, you go girl, you're so powerful, blah, blah, blah. I don't mean it that way. I mean it in the sense that you have to love yourself because you are correct. You are right. There is absolutely nothing wrong with you. There is not a hair on your head that is out of place. You are never going to be as beautiful as you are now. You are, you have everything you need to succeed. It's just you need to fully accept yourself and you just need to go for whatever it is that you want. And you're not going to figure that out until you become comfortable spending time with just yourself. So whatever that takes, whether it's journaling, whether it's meditation, whether it's long walks, self-isolation, I don't think anyone is possible of greatness without solitude. And conversely, I would say with solitude, it's impossible for you to fail. Um, but it's hard. Society now is rigged to give us all these escapes to run away into society. N Naval, when you're speaking about honesty, I want to be clear. You're not you're not saying to be truthful. You're talking more about being vulnerable, correct? I I don't know. I don't I don't I don't really really know about the word vulnerable. Um, well, how about open? Look, look, yeah. yeah the, language is difficult right i say one thing there's like a vision in my head you hear the same word and you have a different idea in your head so vulnerable is not a word that i love to use because i also grew up partially in indian society you know you're not even supposed to share your needs let alone your emotions exactly that's exactly, um, where, I was, <laughs> right. well, that's exactly where i was going because you know i think nicole yeah. can relate to this as well because we come from traditional middle eastern families and we've grown up in a society where you know privacy is it, it's been pushed on us right like keep keep your your life your personal life private don't expose it don't be vulnerable you know yeah i'm the same way i don't i don't write my private life i don't talk about like you know like my, you you're not gonna catch me writing long bios about my childhood or anything like that or you know this or that happened that's not what i mean I, by honesty but isn't because, that part of honesty i mean uh, i'm honest so, with myself so, yeah, yeah 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 no, so I, here, I think, here's yeah. here here's what i mean by honesty what I mean by honesty. Well, let me ask. Is, let me ask a follow-up, Naval, with, with that to take this on. Well, if I, if I, because, if I may just okay, go ahead, on go ahead, if go I ahead. just give go one ahead. example while, while it's fresh in mind. Honesty is, someone screws me over in a deal. I lose lots of money. I was screwed over. I am angry. I am livid. Man, how could this guy screw me over? I trusted him. Honesty is sitting down and saying, okay maybe he didn't screw me over 
maybe I messed up. Maybe I should have shown up to that meeting when I said I was going to show up. Maybe I should have delivered what I said I was going to deliver. Maybe he took a look at the cards and decided that I wasn't the right partner for him. And he realized that there were other people out there who were better because I hadn't hustled hard enough. Maybe I'm getting worked up over nothing, or maybe it's at least 60% my fault. It's really easy to be honest about other people's flaws. It's incredibly difficult to be honest about your own. So this addresses the vulnerability point. It's not about being vulnerable to the outside world. The other outside world doesn't need to know your internal business. It's about being vulnerable to yourself. It's about challenging your own ideas about yourself. It's about challenging the voice in your head that's always telling you exactly how the world works. So, so, so I, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. I just want to ask one question really quickly because this sounds a lot like when you kept using the word grudge, all I could think of was resentment. And then when you were talking about exa ex everything you just said lined up with looking at your own part in a particular issue that you're having with another person, and it doesn't have to do with announcing to the world um, your wrongdoings or your character defects, rather just one other person. And I'm wondering if you think that there's value in 12-step or if you think that it's more of a process you should always do by yourself. Oh, I, I, you know, look, I, I'm never going to say do this technique or don't do that technique because different things work for different people. If 12-step works for you, fantastic, do it. I've just never tried it. Uh, I, I don't, I just, like, for example, you know, there are people in my life who use therapists and they get huge value out of it. Um, I use meditation. That's self-therapy. I just sit there and listen to myself and who knows me better than me. Uh, and it's cheaper <laughs> and it's free. I can do it every yes. morning, right? So whichever technique works for you, do it. Just do something that helps raise your level of self-awareness. Some people need to have their words echoed back to them slightly reconfigured. So they get value out of talking to friends or a therapist or psychic hotlines. All a psychic hotline is you pay 20 bucks an hour, 30 bucks an hour for some stranger to sit there and talk to you, preferably a, a, you know, a mother-like character who's going to kind of console you and has some sort of authority through the astrology or whatever, or psychic powers, even though it's not real, it doesn't have to be real. Just someone's willing to talk to you and listen to you. Whichever method works is fine. These are all ways of exploring yourself. And so in that sense, I think they're all valid. Now, they can become games too. They can become traps. If you're the 12 step person who's always going to 12 steps and then 24 steps and then 36 steps, you know, at some point you get off that, you gotta get off that wagon, right? The, again, I can't prescribe for you. I'll tell you what worked well for me. I find it's easier to just drop the past completely than it is to try and fix it. <laughs> you know, the past is like this giant, messy hairball of narratives and you can spend your entire life trying to untangle your past and in some ways the more you dive into it the more it kind of traps you in there and it can actually become weirdly comforting because that can become your purpose or meaning you're kind of on that inner journey and if you enjoy that then fine do it but if if, it, if you're suffering through it and you're untangling it slowly i hope that at some point you just get sick of it and drop the whole thing it's sort of like if you're ever trying to go through old emails and there's just too many of them piled up. And at some point, you're just like, okay, screw it. Select all, delete, <laughs> right? And if you can get to that point, I highly recommend it. I've heard you say before, um, it's best to be rich and anonymous and never famous. Um, I agree. And, and I do want to go back to Sam's point because we are Persian Jews. And um, we, we were taught to be very private, but also... I, I feel like I was taught to feel a lot of shame about everything, like uh, sex, mental health, everything. Do you, do you have any kind of like relationship with shame or advice about shame? Because I know there's a lot of people from different cultures in the audience who were taught the same thing. I mean, there are people in the audience who were taught that they shouldn't go to therapy and, and therapy does help a lot of people. So anything on shame? Well, I think this is also, Naval, sorry, a Jewish thing, but also, Nicole, I, I think this is a generational thing as well, because I feel like a lot of people's parents in previous generations were all taught similar values, and that our generation is leaning towards meditation and therapy and self-help. But, Naval, sorry, I, I'm going to mute. Uh, I, the, 
shame is a part of social conditioning, as is guilt, right? Guilt is society's voice speaking in your head. And shame is uh, society warning you, like, hey, you should feel bad about this, because if we catch you, we're going to make you feel even worse. So it's social conditioning. Uh, now, some social conditioning can be good. You know, I don't know if you ever, if any of you ever had the experience where, like, you have to take your clothes off in public. Like, let's say you're in a, in a, in a situation where it's acceptable to do that. Like, you go to, like, a, some hot springs or a bath where everyone's nude. It's an incredibly uncomfortable feeling to take your clothes off in public if you've never done it. Like, like literally, your hands will resist you. Like, you're, you're conditioned like an animal. It's like a dog who's worn a collar too long being told to take his collar off. It's hard to do. So society conditions you like an animal, and it uses guilt and shame as sort of these drivers to remind you of what to do and what not to do. Is this always terrible? No. I mean, there's some good advice that comes with it, right? So, for example, uh, you know, it, it might be designed from a time when there was no contraception, and it was to keep women from getting pregnant through kind of an early encounter with some guy that they barely knew. And then next thing you know, their life is over because they're having someone's kid who they barely know. Or it could have been to avoid spreading or getting some kind of a disease or to breaking a law and ending up in jail or killing somebody, right? So society, social conditioning is not always bad. You need it to function, but a lot of it is obsolete, right? The problem is our parents' generation is not the generation that we live in. So we, we have to figure it out for ourselves. Uh, and that's the beauty of life. We're not just here to repeat what our parents told us, uh, but they, they give us kind of a good default operating system. Now, you have a Persian Jewish operating system, cultural operating system installed in you, and maybe that doesn't apply to the world that you're living in. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, the problem is the, the word shame is so broad, it can be applied in many, many different contexts. But overall, I would say it, this, this comes back to self-awareness. If you were sitting there, and journaling or meditating and realizing every time the shame emotion came up and you unpacked it and you understood why you were having it and you could kind of say oh well that's why i'm feeling ashamed and does that really apply anymore or does it not apply anymore it, it's that instead of, when, when you have these emotions instead of getting caught up in them and swept away with them and identifying with them if you were to kind of analyze them a little dispassionately, and that's one thing therapy is good for, right? Someone else is analyzing that emotion for you, or meditation where you're just watching it play out, or journaling where you're writing about it and it's cathartic, then you can sort of decide which of these you want to keep and which of these you don't. Because when you have kids, you'll be doing it to your kids too, right? You'll tell your kids, hey, put your underwear on. Why? <laughs> right? My, my kid is always asking why. Anything I tell him to do, he needs an explanation, right? Um, which is good. And so I think we should all have explanations for why we feel ashamed or why we feel guilty. But it doesn't mean that it's always wrong to feel ashamed or guilty. These can be very practical. It's just some of these may be obsolete. So, so I want to believe there's a part of me. And by the way, Naval, much of what you're saying, I, I really find very compelling. You're a very charismatic speaker. I love your motto. You know, don't take anyone's word for it, essentially, and test it out yourself. I get that. There are a couple of things I want to pin you down on, though, because I don't know whether I believe you or disbelieve you, because I don't know if whether you're saying this or you're saying that. And one of the pieces is, you know, this idea of radical individuality, radical agency, you know, there's something very deep and compelling there. And I'm with you on it to a very large extent. There's a big but for me, though. And that is, I think there's strong and compelling evidence that we humans know ourselves, gain self-awareness by introspection, but also through other people. If I want to see my face, a mirror is useful. If I want to see the back of my head, a couple of mirrors are essential. And so seeing our blind spots are seen are often seen through the mirrors of other people, which enhances our self awareness. And so I, I'm trying to understand if you are advocating on the final sum of it that this is a radically individual enterprise, or is this a radically individual and interpersonal and communal enterprise? Because my sense is you're strongly vectored in one direction, which I respect. And like I said, I go with you further down that road, probably most. 
but I cannot go down a road that doesn't also say there's a fundamental role in the relational and communal aspects and that there are limits. You know, there are very fun. You even said it yourself. These are aspirational points of view, and I totally get it. We talked about conditional versus unconditional happiness. I think there's a relation here in the deep structure of what we're talking about. But there are some real limits. And, you know, one of the things that I find in the valley, <laughs> right, what tech calls thinking, Dow's book, I think, is fantastic at pointing this out over and over again. And how we in Silicon Valley are obsessed with the infinitude, the possibility, you know, the horizon points. But we are so damn bad at accepting that there are real limitations to our free will, real limitations to our ability to be self-aware. And that we need to see ourselves through other people and through communities to be whole. And so I want to understand more deeply what you mean when you talk about the pathway to happiness and the role of the individual relative to the role of the relational and communal. Because I think I agree with you on a number of points, but I think I might fundamentally disagree with you on some others. And obviously, you give room for us to all test it ourselves with your your creed, which I respect and agree with. But I want to get a sense of where you stand. I don't prescribe anything. I advocate nothing. I recommend nothing. I tell you what worked for me. I reject community. I reject groups. I reject consensus. I reject others. I love others. I take care of them. I embrace them. I help them, but it's because I myself am strong and individual and whole. And it's I am my own responsibility. Everything I feel, everything I think, everything that happens to me, I take agency for. I take Got responsibility it. for. So, so this I, is essentially I, I, I reject. Yeah. I reject everything from the group because the group is always there to convince you of what's right for the group, not what's right for the individual. Oh, no, but no, a group no. Is just I, a I fundamentally disagree. No, no, no. I don't, I don't I agree you, that's I know you do. as well. I, I know you do. And I'm being radical here. I'm actually being extreme. I'm overstating my position. I'm actually a lot more middle of the road. But I'm overstating my position because the group is always ready to jump on you and turn you into one of the group, always. And it's very difficult in society to stand alone. I mean, I have a perspective. I'd love to hear your perspective, Naval. I, I mean, I'm a social scientist by nature, and one of the questions I wanted to ask you, Naval, was, do you believe that this is necessarily necessarily ideographic? It's necessarily a path of one, and that there are no generalizable truths across humans. I, I, that's a question I had for you. Uh, that well, that latter statement strikes me as too extreme. There are no generalizable truths across humans. I mean, I think that there are definitely things that are more likely to work and less likely to work. Obviously, each human's life is unique and everything is contextual, but at the same time, reality is a thing, right? Gravity is a thing. Objects held up on the earth fall down at 9.8 meters per second squared, right? Same way, like, uh, you know, laughter is good medicine. Uh, it's uh, sunlight releases dopamine or serotonin on the, when, it, when on the skin. So there are generalizable truths that do apply. Uh, but the set of things that are generally true is actually fairly narrow, right? It's limited probably to, uh, you know, hard sciences uh, and maybe to some epistemology, aka the theory of knowledge, maybe some philosophy. And uh, after that, you're pretty pretty thin ice, right? When it, certainly when it comes down to questions of like, how should you live your life? There are some truths, right? And, but again, it depends what you want. Like to me, I don't, I don't, I don't like to talk philosophy, right? And a lot of people talk philosophy and they say, oh, you're a philosopher. I, I almost consider that an insult. I, I think it's much more practical. It's very utilitarian. Uh, if if you have a point of view on something that will get you what you want out of life, then it is useful. Like, let me give you an example. People talk a lot about relationships, right? It's probably one of the most common topics. Everybody loves to talk about relationships all the time. And usually they're talking about romantic relationships, right? So one truth that I heard in relationships that over time I realized this is a deep truth. Again, doesn't 100% always apply, but it does apply most of the time to most people and it's utilitarian because it helps you get what you want and that truth was when you first enter into a relationship you should be selfish 
Okay. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't mean being inordinately selfish. I don't mean being like incredibly selfish. I just mean being like your normal selfish self. We're all selfish, right? All of us. You have to be, otherwise you wouldn't survive. So an aspect level of, of ourself is selfish, but exactly. that, I would I wouldn't agree with you that all of us is selfish. An aspect okay, of ourself to, is selfish. I'm not trying to insult anybody, so we don't necessarily need to make people feel better either. I think most people understand when I say you're selfish. I, I I'm speaking the truth. If you think I'm lying, if you think then then sure. But I think deep down we do things for ourselves, right? We do. Like all of us are trying at every good moment in time to live up to our own self image and to make ourselves happier, et cetera. And what happens in so, yeah. Yes. Yeah, getting back to my relationship point. When you first get into a relationship, uh, when you're first in that kind of honeymoon period, the first six months, the first 12 months, you're on your best behavior trying to make the other person happy. And they're on their best behavior trying to make you happy, right? The guy is opening doors and buying dinners and, you know, cleaning up after himself and putting the toilet seat down. And the woman is, you know, being like very demure and charming and fun and always dressing well and doing her makeup and trying to be responsive and laugh even when his jokes aren't funny and, you know, have sex even when she doesn't want to, like all of those things, right? You're just, you're doing all these things to make the other person happy. And then eventually it wears off. You just can't keep it up anymore. You can't live a lie for your entire life. So eventually it starts wearing off. And then we get in discussions of like, you've changed. How come it's not working? It's not like it used to be. Why do we fight so much now? And one of the truths that I realized is that when you're in a relationship, you actually want to be, this is why I say, I, I use words like selfish to be provocative. So it sticks in your head. Uh, yes, it may offend people just slightly, but that's how you get them to remember it. <laughs> this is a little secret, right? Um, so fair, but I'm more interested yeah. less uh, less in rhetoric, more in in the truth of it, though, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I'm less interested in making people bit. feel good, um, than, and more in just making the point. So anyway, the um, my point is that if you behave like your normal everyday selfish self at the beginning of a relationship, then you wouldn't get you wouldn't have false starts in relationships. You wouldn't waste two years at a time figuring out that it's not going to work. You'd figure it out in the first 30 days. And then when you do find the right person, the right person by definition will make you happy by just being themselves. And you will make them happy by being just yourself. And you can sustain that for a lot longer. And it's a much easier, smoother relationship. So that is an example of, I think, a. it's not generalizable in the sense of E equals MC squared. It's not that solid. But it's generalizable in the sense of it does apply to most relationships. It is an insight and it can improve the quality of your relationships. So it's sort of a practical philosophy about relationships. So, yes, so there are I think you and I agree there then, which is there are some things that are, you know, more generalizable or less so. And I think we also agree that then you have to, whether or not it's a generalizable principle, you have to live into it yourself in your own experience and test it out. Yeah, so I think we, yeah. I think we, we have a alignment and agreement there. Where I think we have perhaps a different point of view is the utility in the relational aspect and the limitations around self and how I as a self, how deeply self-aware I can be, how deeply self-agency I can be. And I think I have a perspective and an experience that we are individual selves and relational selves perhaps more than I'm hearing you do. And, I, and I'm just testing that out, but I, my sense is that we have a difference there. And, and yes, that my belief do. is that, we, <laughs> that, that, I, that the utility of relation, this goes back to Leah's 12-step example. I think in some of these cases, it's actually fundamentally necessary to have an interpersonal or communal experience, at least to bootstrap our way through a, a, a healing process of a certain sort or a developmental process at a certain stage. Or we just may need to have that period for the rest of our lives in order to be the best version of ourselves in a cultural relational matrix as I define myself and my values and my morality. And so I think that's where you and I depart. And I respect your point of view. I, I hope you feel that way and see that. But I respectfully disagree in terms of 
the utility and necessity of the relational piece and the communal piece. Oh, this is really all you want. It's no skin off my back. I don't care. Oh, of course. Of course. <laughs> no, this, this, this is, you know, this is a performative. We're, we're doing a performative act. Anybody well, like this isn't just for you and I. This is, right? We're, we're all yeah, sitting but, out loud here to figure things out. I, I mean, what? You know, you know one, of, one, of, one of the things that I love about life is that I am a weird character. I am a lonely character. I, I, I have very extreme points of view that are way out in left field, and that allows me to be exceptional. I don't want a world full of clones like me running around. It'd be pretty boring. Yes. Well, and I think how we got here is, um, uh, Naval, you've been sharing a lot of knowledge this evening, but or this morning, geez. Um, but we're talking about how knowledge and leverage are ways to create wealth. And the idea I think you're trying to express, Naval, and, and kind of chiming back in here, uh, is that there is a level of individuality or self-determination that is, is, is kind of inherent in being accountable and making decisions and taking actions. I'm not sure if that anchors in on, on what you're expressing, Naval. Well, look, the, the, the DNA, the combinatorics of human DNA are staggering. Uh, if you take the genetic structure of any human being, you scramble it up, You'll, and you keep rolling those dice over and over and over, and you do it trillions and trillions of times, you're never going to find any two human beings who are even vaguely similar. I'll bet in your entire life, you've never met two different unrelated human beings where you're like, yeah, this one's a substitute for that one. They're nothing alike. Humans are so individualistic. We are so different and so unique from each other that that inner world that you have of your internal mind and your mindset and that outer uh, that expression you have of your capabilities is so unbelievably unique to you that uh, all I'm arguing uh, is that there is tremendous benefit in embracing your uniqueness to the core, to the max, way more than society wants you to, way more than society makes you feel comfortable doing. Nafal, what does the meaning of your name mean? It means the new one, like the new man. In, in which language? Sanskrit. Do you, do you know it's the meaning of Naval in Hebrew? Yeah, it means the thief, the trickster, the, the Jew. You're definitely the trickster. The villain, yeah. It's funny, my name in Hebrew, Michael Ronen, means who is as happy as God. And I will leave you with that to go to sleep. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Michael. <laughs> what a flex. What a flex.